Hi, everybody. David Noor. want to welcome you back to another episode of our Avnir Intelligent Growth with my business partner, Jen Kortz. Hello, Jen. Hi, Noor. Happy holidays. Likewise. I'm excited about this background. Look at this. It was in uh, London recently, and I love how festive they get so early in the season. And as our last episode, I believe this is episode 49 of Intelligent Growth this year, I thought I'd share a festive background. And before we start, I just want to wish everybody a, a fantastic holiday season. We celebrate Christmas, so Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah, uh, Happy Holidays, and and uh, wishing everybody a, a prosperous New Year. Uh, we thought, Jen and I thought, um, in, instead of uh, future gazing, which we're not going to do, if, if I had a crystal ball, I'd be on the next flight to Vegas. Uh, so we're, we're not going to future gaze. But based on our client observations this past year, based on what we're reading, what we're seeing, what we're hearing, what we write about, um, you know, I've, I've spoken with a half a dozen executives in the last couple of days alone. And one of my favorite questions is, what are you most excited about next year? And what are you most concerned about? And between those conversations, obviously our purview is, is growth. And, and I got to tell you, I've never met a company that can cut its way to growth. So there's a lot of companies, and, 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 and it's unfortunate uh, that you hear about that just, you know, out, outgrew themselves mad during the pandemic. And they somehow equated pandemic growth with forever growth. And now they've gone through two, three rounds of layoffs. And it's heartbreaking because really good people join the company, get excited about making a difference. Everything's going great. And to no fault of the executives, other than kind of their, their appetite, right? Their, their uh, eagerness outpaces their, their ability to kind of that long-term predict the revenue and their growth trajectory. And so what Jen and I want to do is really talk about 2024 growth projections, hopefully intelligent growth projections, uh, given that there's there's a whole bunch of uncertainty. Here in the US, we've got the, it's a political year. And if you're already fed up with political ads, you just wait because we have a whole lot more in the store for you. And, and it just gets to be like much, and like to the point that you want to stop watching TV and listening to radio. And so we got that. We've got the uncertainty of the, the financial market. There's still a lot of uh, pressures on inflationary pressures. There's, a, there's still concerns about especially tech sector layoffs. By the same token, we've got industrial manufacturing clients that are doing really well. We've got, um, you know, several companies travel industry right now still doing really well and strong. Uh, I've got several clients in construction. They're still, they're still, believe it or not, going strong. So with all the uncertainty, again, Jen and I want to focus on our conversations, our kind of predictions for intelligent growth this next year. We are live on Facebook and LinkedIn and YouTube and X. Uh, and if you haven't left for vacation and if you haven't completely checked out, We'd love to have you come join us and jump in with your questions or comments. And of course, you can watch this later and or consume it as a podcast wherever you consume podcasts. So, Jen, let me start with you. Give me, let's, we're going to do this back and forth. Give me one observation from 23 that you either believe is going to carry into 24 or something you're really excited about in 24. So in 24, and based on our client work and the conversations that we've had, I really think that organizations are going to be doubling down on that unified customer experience. We call it the 360 degree view of uh, your customer. And so that's, that's ensuring that it's consistent across marketing, sales, customer success, and how you talk to them is anticipating what they may need and less focus on you as the business. Uh, love that. I'm going to go with something that I heard uh, leading up to Saster for our audience uh, for the first time this past year. I went to something called Saster. It is the largest gathering of SaaS uh, software companies. And, and Jen has been to like a whole bunch of them, but I was a newbie, right? So, and I'm walking around and, 
you know, just, just soaking it all in and something like 12,000 people show up at this thing and leading up to it. And then right after I'm also a limited partner in the go to market fund that we had our go to market fund summit. And this idea of a defensible moat kind of came up several times and I'm really fascinated by it of how do you take a core competency, regardless of what business you're in, and really build, continue to build uh, a defensible moat around that core competency, around that uh, real strength, real uh, viability that you bring to the table. And more importantly, and something that, that I really want the audience to think about is just because a, a differentiator, right, was of great value this year or last year, especially with how pervasive AI has become, does not mean it'll be a defensible mode next year. So, so I really want you to think about this idea of a defensible mode uh, and, um, and, and really focusing on how do we continue to build those differentiators in a sustainable way. So Jen and I are going to, are yin and yang, um, and we've got our respective list that we've been thinking about. Uh, we want to just kind of go through this list and talk about Talk about some of these. So, Jen, we want to start with yours. Well, I was just gonna, I was just gonna make a comment on uh, the leveraging of AI and, and having a defensible moat. I think coming into 2024, the the advent of AI being incorporated into nearly everything is really no longer a, a product differentiation. So, the consumers are expecting that there's going to be some level of AI or large language model in any and all tools that they're adopting or already have within their tech stack. So honing in on, oh, well, we have AI or these capabilities, like you're going to see some of that um, downplayed versus being the, the core differentiation that that company is promoting. It's a great, great point. It's, it's almost like, do you remember we used to call it e-commerce? Yeah. And now, and now it's just commerce, right? The exact same idea is is the AI, you know, was was absolutely talk of the year. Uh, I, I've read a great deal about it, and and certainly on top of a lot of leaders' minds, we're still very much at the cusp. We're still very much at that uh, early stage of intrigue, early stage of. I, I'm I'm reminded of the Gardner hype cycle. AI's been around forever. When Lester Holt talks about AI, you know it's become mainstream. And now, you know, a lot of organizations are really thinking about what they're doing, how they're doing it. The big players are obviously have integrated it in. So what that means for every leader is you cannot bury your head in the sand. You cannot wait for this to happen to you. Uh, I'm a, you know, we're avid readers and and really looking for use cases, really looking for, uh, and we've got a research going on where we're, we're focused on our wheelhouse of the consequences, both positive and negative, of AI on enterprise relationships. And that research has led to now a solo or a duo keynote and very interactive to show every imaginable part of a business getting infused with AI intelligence to do a lot of the heavy lifting. Uh, many of you know, in Avnir, we're working on our own kind of platform to intelligently engage, influence, activate hidden relationship value. So Jen, I couldn't agree more. I think that's going to become the e-commerce. It's just, well, it's just commerce and, and incorporated in every facet of, uh, of what's happening. Most definitely. And just to build on that, I think if your organization today and what we've seen a lot of organizations uh, this past year, they don't necessarily have a good strategy on how to incorporate or leverage some of those AI capabilities that their tech stack now has. And so coming into 2024, a lot of leaders are going to be focused on deepening that investment to streamline what they're doing and how they're doing it and taking some of those time consuming tasks and re reimagining them or having their operations team refactor them into an AI workflow. For instance, like lead generation or lead capture, uh, the nurturing, there are really interesting tools out there that have been incorporated with Gong and Clary to do sales coaching based off of 
call recordings, uh, having a more robust auto response system or like an RFP response where somebody asks a question and it's a pretty canned response. Those things will be more geared towards AI and those simplified workflows. So then their actual high, high value assets, their team members can focus on, on better revenue generation tasks. I love that. And, and, and to build on that, uh, again, I'm having several conversations with, with, with executives on, I believe very soon, if not this very next year, you'll have AI and, and many organizations already do send out messages, right? Send out email campaigns, newsletters, AI generated and based on, and, and, and it's an attempt at mass customization. And so be it's not inconceivable to think about then AI on the receiving side. So so can I have and maybe Microsoft or Apple, somebody else incorporates AI into now receiving all those to figure out which one's relevant, which one isn't, which one's a priority, which one isn't. So now we've got AI talking to AI. So I believe. Uh, I was talking to Bill Hogan, longtime friend and client, and and uh, a discussion of what's old is new again. What what we did, you know, I tell my kids I didn't paint on the gray hair. What what was um, relevant and successful and a formula to differentiate yourself? Forget years, decades ago, is back in that one on one relationships and referrals and recommendations. And you still, I'm not taking anything away from marketing's efforts to create awareness and add value and create engagement, air cover. Yet I believe at every level, executive, leader, manager, frontline, one-on-one -on -one connections will separate you from your peers. So, I, I've started to, Jen, you're going to chuckle. I've started to add in my emails. This email was not generated by an AI engine. I actually took the time to, you know, customize this and wrote it to you. So please don't have your AI engine reply back <laughs> and, and, and let's meet for a cup of coffee. <laughs> well, and, I, and I think that's actually something that we're going to see more and more of. Gartner recently released their predictions for 2024. And one of the things that they did mention in that report was organizations are going to start promoting content authenticity or brand endorsed user generated content. So you will then know this content was actually approved and published by the organization versus this was AI generated. So to your point about relationships and having that one-to-one -one connection, it's going to continue to be really important to hone the, that empathy and those skills to make human connection and not just rely on the technology because technology only goes so far. You have to still have the human element involved. And, and, and I want to go back to something our previous guest, we had John Barrows of JB Sales on, and, and, I, and I loved, and we're taking this to heart, of... Uh, the market facing leaders really wrapping their arms around, really loving on and supporting particularly that next generation in elevating, Jen, I really appreciate this J, JB's comment on elevating business acumen, elevating, taking, you know, you know and, I, and, I, and I absolutely subscribe to his assertion that AI is going to take over you know, the SDR and BDR roles. And, and that's a lot of heavy lifting and it can it can do that analysis much better than than some, you know, 22 year old sitting making 100 calls, you know, dials a day to talk to one person. That's just, it's insanity, especially tech companies that keep doing that. I'm wondering, why are we not getting through, right? So what if we took that young person and, and really thought differently about, Teaching them, take fewer. You cannot do this with hundreds of people or thousands of people. How do we take them under our wings and teach them business acumen, teach them end-to-end -end selling, teach them engagement and influence and credibility and you know how to in interact in a meaningful way? And I think they're just you're setting them up for far greater success than hey, here's a 
pitch book and a script and you've got 30 days and good luck. Let me know how that goes for you. So, so I, I think, again, we should also revisit with the pervasiveness of AI this next year, how do we pour more love and support and investment in our developing our people, their acumen, their ability to communicate, their ability to think critically, their ability to solve problems, their ability to make decisions, all of these things that I, we're not going to go on a tangent, that I believe our education system is neglecting a lot of our kids, then let's bring them into their first job or bring them into their spring of their career and really help them develop those skills, those not acknowledge those behaviors. Well, and I, I couldn't agree with you more. And with that, the changing of the role of a BDR and SDR, I, I want to make sure that everybody hears that we're not uh, making the assertion that AI is going to replace those people. It is going to replace some of the manual or menial tasks that they were doing and allowing them to focus on those deeper relationship value add type behaviors so that do take the business acumen and the relationship building skills that they don't come into their role with. So leveraging AI as a way to coach and help them learn some of these skills is going to be very important, but it is not going to full on replace those people. Yep. So I know that's a, a scare and things that everybody keeps talking about. AI is replacing my job. No, it's not. <laughs> it, it, it is taking, as you said, a lot of that, the mundane, a lot of the heavy lifting that just is very difficult for individuals to keep up and obviously automating it. So moving on to the next topic. So what, you know, one was, was really this defensible mode that I brought up. We talked about, you know, AI and the pervasiveness of AI and, and really becoming kind of table stakes. We talked about it having a ripple effect on your learning and development and on really elevating the business acumen of, of your go-to-market or of your of your sales team, your marketing team, your customer success teams. The next one I want to talk about is, is really looking for proactively pockets. Uh, almost like a granular pockets of profitable market growth. And let me let me just dive into that for a second. A lot of organizations talk about ICP. Well, we all know ICPs and personas are the umbrella, right? There's a there's a massive umbrella of here's the type of person that's that is having the problems we solve and we could focus on. I, I, I want you to think of this idea of an ideal relationship profile. And by that, I mean, beyond the demographic, psychographic, all that information, who gets me? Who? And by the way, relationships are not between buildings or logos. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to carry that flag till the day I die, right? It's never between buildings or logos. It's always between individuals. So who gets me? Who gets our unique value add? Who gets? Uh, I, I've 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 done a good job building a rapport with who I can treat as a peer, who I can work with in a meaningful way and add value to. Layman's terms, who's my you know our kind of person, right? Um, I, I don't live in Alabama, but if they say Roll Tide, a lot of people know that's just their way of they're, they're my kind of people. In Georgia, we say Go Dogs or Go Jackets, right? You know, Jen from Washington, the Huskies, and they're also different kind of dogs. But, <laughs> but that's a relationship on ramp that creates a almost like an instant connection because of that history, that legacy together. So, I believe there are pockets of really profitable growth opportunities. Maybe not within a sector, or an industry, or even a geography, but there's certain relationships that and certain companies, individual leaders, segments of your ICP that are going to thrive, not just survive. They're going to thrive in 24. Will you be there to support them? Will you be there to become rocket boosters attached to the shuttle? Would you find those? Don't discount the entire tech sector. Don't discount the entire financial services or professional services because you hear the headlines, or you read the headlines, looking for those pockets of profitable growth, I think would be really astute as a growth strategy this next year. I would agree with you. And I would just add on that, that 
by being really intentional, just don't just take your ICP or even your ABM strategy and blanket it to across an entire industry. To your point, be really intentional about who and what, and then also the why will you, your business solution product help them and really focus on the benefits that they're going to, to receive versus why are you the best choice? And so differentiating based off of that value and being seen as a value enabler and actually a partner in that space versus just a vendor is going to be really important coming into uh, the new year. The next one uh, I want to talk about is is uh, benchmarking and specifically benchmarking key facets of your growth against your competitive peers. I, I got to tell you, uh, and again, Je Jen knew this gentleman or knew his reputation, but at Saster, uh, Dave Kellogg uh, really left a an imprint uh, on you know just I I don't know the gentleman. Uh, but, but fantastic. You can, you can look him up. He's got a blog now that I subscribe to and his presentation was all about SAS metrics and benchmarking and, and really getting and knowing, you know, your finger on the pulse in essence of your business and whether you're a tech founder or a PL executive, understanding the nuances of, of your metrics and, and really looking at, really identifying benchmarking opportunities at a granular level. Uh, and what I, what I really appreciated about his comment was not just really understanding what's happening, but why. And, and am I comparing apples and apples? And are we reviewing the same metrics quarter after quarter after quarter? Or are those things changing? And, and do we understand why they're changing and how to change them? So not just we've always advocated not just growth for sake of growth but the whole point the title of this thing intelligent growth hopefully profitable growth hopefully uh growth that we can learn from in both direction so i'm a, I'm a big believer when things are going really well you better get your finger on the pulse of why and it's not because your good looks or your charm why is where's that growth coming from why are we growing in the way we're growing and then conversely, if we're not, if if pipelines are slipping, if forecast is slipping or not as accurate, if we're missing our number right beyond the macro that you have no control over, how can we really kind of tighten that aperture and understand? So that's benchmarking is a is a big, big one that I believe this next year will also be invaluable. Jen? I'd love to build on that one because benchmarking, looking historically at, at the lagging indicators is going to be really important. But there are several tools probably within your tech stack. Salesforce has released a whole bunch of new reporting features in their most recent updates this past year. But understanding what those are is going to be important to incorporate them into your dashboards and also incorporating real time data into your decision-making process into your data and reports, because it's great to look back at how did we perform this last quarter, but that performance last quarter may not tell you what's happening today. And with all the economic and job employment and everything else insecurity that's happening, it will be really important to stay on top of the trends and be agile enough as an organization to shift your tactics, to maintain your momentum and, and not just have a massive cliff that your sales fall off. You need to be able to have those real-time metrics that you can trust and make data-driven decisions on that are informed and that you can turn the boat before it's already a problem. That, that agility, Jen, that you bring up, uh, I believe needs to be elasticity in the business model. Uh, again, we're, we're a small team, but a friend mentioned that I tend to really get creative. I tend to really come up with net new growth opportunities when it seems like the market and some of our, our biggest customers are contracting. When they pull back, that's when I, I get creative and find net new avenues for us to pursue With, within, again, our wheelhouse. If I start talking about cooking, I think I would confuse the heck out of a lot of people because that's just that's just not within our purview, right? 
but within this idea of strategic growth, intelligent growth, relationship centric growth, uh, finding net new growth opportunities allows you to weather the storm, allows you to weather the uncertainty. So it'd be really useful for the audience. If I can use an analogy, think of the target logo and at the center, no, no question about it. That's your core that, that, and that core it's also the trunk of the tree. It absolutely needs to be solidified. It needs to be turbocharged. It needs to be have the resources to really thrive. That that trunk of the tree, that that target center of the target logo, that should be a, a massive amount of the of the focus. Yet, as I said earlier, when I said there are these granular pockets of profitable opportunities, a really good way to think of that are the branches or the outer rings of the of the target logo. So we are beyond our core. Will our business plan allow us to identify, generate early wins, different or new use cases? You have no idea the creative way in which some companies, some client companies will leverage your, will utilize your unique value, your tools, your platforms. So if you expand your purview and look beyond the tree trunk or beyond that target logo to the outer rings or to the branches, we believe and we've seen clients and we've done it ourselves, generate incremental growth opportunities, really interesting growth. You don't want to go so far on the branch that the branch breaks and you fall, or you don't want to go so far off the logo that you fall off the page. By the same token, they're, they're tangential, they're adjacent market opportunities that I think a lot of organizations miss out on. Jen? Well, I would, I would say that looking at those opportunities also means that you can also look at like past case studies and what clients have said about you and maybe the value that you brought to them. And it may not have been a focus at that time that you did, but most if you're in the SaaS industry, your your product has evolved and changed, and now you may be able to help them with a problem that you couldn't have then. And so revisiting some of those old opportunities or old customers and land, expanding what you're doing and how you're providing value to those people is going to be important to your to your long term growth and and keep it from being a hockey stick every every quarter or every month, but retaining your customers and doing more with them and helping them impact their own customers. So it's not just your customers, but your customers' customers getting deep in that relationship, understanding how you can help them grow will then help you grow. And and, and you bring up a great point. I, I was a guest on the um, top one percenters uh, podcast with, with longtime friend, Paul Salamanca. And, and, and I use the analogy or I use the, the, the expression that I've been using for years of know me, like me, trust me and pay me. Let me say it again, because it works in this sequence and those, regardless of the size of the enterprise, those who try to circumvent it, shoot themselves in the foot, know me. Right. And, 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 um, We've got a friend who talks about, you know, show me, you know me, right? So if you invest the time to get to know me, hopefully you'll see opportunities that you, you like me. There's a likability factor to all of us. When you like me, there's opportunities to hopefully you can see that you can trust me. Only when you trust me will you buy from me. And not just my products and services, but also my ideas and my perspective and why and how we should go in this direction or invest in this approach to cybersecurity and data. And so so Jen's comment of go back and revisit with the old customers, revisit with past relationships. At some point, they knew you and liked you and hopefully respected you and trusted you. And, and all of that lends itself really nicely to uncovering net new growth opportunities, uncovering those pockets, uncovering different avenues. Jen? I would agree. And then looking beyond that, so one of the things that we've talked about and worked with our clients on, we have the customer lifecycle journey maturity model. And what that does is takes each stage of your business from marketing, sales, customer success, and really unifies that journey. So to your point of 
uh, how somebody engages with you, know me, like me, trust me, buy from me, like those steps follow the same infinity loop or can be layered on top of what we call our infinity loop, the customer lifecycle journey maturity model to help you understand and fine tune your messaging along the way. So the left side of the infinity model, we've got it posted on our website and we can repost it in the forum with this, this episode, but it's focused on the sales marketing. It's that awareness. And then in the middle, that's when they're going through their buying process. So how are you talking about them then? And then the right side is more, how do you incorporate customer success and create that impact for them to become your evangelists and then loop back around and repeat the process with other business units, with other geographies, et cetera. And so I think in 24, what we're seeing a lot of organizations focus on is unifying that. They've they've defined their ICPs. They know who they need to talk to and maybe what they're selling those people, but then creating that unified journey across all of them and then breaking the silos between those departments to have all of that information at the fingertips so that experience is consistent across the board. So then when somebody is engaging with marketing and then they move to sales, it's the same likability factor that they had with marketing. And it's not now an entirely different experience. So it it also then deepens that trust with the organization and with those people you're engaging with. This thread also uh, makes me think of at at our our, uh, Relationship Economics Summit, again, longtime friend, former Coke senior executive, Eric McCarthy, talked about C2, the, the, the letter C and, and the number two, and the premise of, of really think about your customers' customers, really thinking about going one level deep beyond who you sell to, to then really get an early glimpse of the things they care about, to really understand what impacts, materially impacts their business. And what, uh, you know, by identifying the needs of your customers' customers or how your customers interact with their customers, it can shed a light into not just your own messaging and positioning, but your, as Jen mentioned, your value creation, your how are those relationships better off because of us? Not just transactionally what products or services do we offer, but what are they doing with it? And, and what else could they be doing with it? And again, I just, I'm a huge believer of 24 has to be the year we double down on some of these relationships. Fewer, but deeper, more meaningful. We're going to go spend time with them. We're going to go sit next to them as they engage their customers, as they add value to their market as they struggle with their supply chain or their distribution or their logistics or whatever facet of their business there is that that we believe we can materially impact. When you do that, I just think you you dramatically elevate the perception of the value that you bring and materialize that value. So so that's a really good opportunity to, to understand and go deeper. Your customers, customers become incredible source of insights. Couldn't agree with you more. And then another topic that we've been talking about also is that personalization at scale. Uh, So it is the value that you bring, but then also how are you focusing your solution on the people that are going to be most impactful? Because you can't, you can't boil the ocean. You can't talk to everyone in the same way, but by identifying the relationships that will get the most from your solution will then allow you to tailor your messaging in a way that will resonate with them and they'll see themselves within your solution and leveraging your product and and be more receptive to some of those conversations. So creating that personalization at scale in a meaningful way is something that we're going to see in 24 because with AI and with a lot of the tools and the automation and the workflows, like you can do personalization at scale However, in 23, and I mean, even before 23, we see companies struggle with that because their data isn't clean or they have, they just ad hoc create something and shoot it off. And then you have dear John and the person's name, they like going by Jonathan. Like that's a clear indication that that was not who, that wasn't personalized to them. And with some of the AI tools that we've seen, it actually becomes very tailored to the person based off of their personality, based off of things that they post about. There's one tool that we 
leverage within our own tech stack that allows you to personalize LinkedIn messages. So they actually will resonate. And it, this tool looks at your LinkedIn and actually will tell you the best ways to engage with them. Do they like formal greetings? Do they like bullet points? Do they want to be conversational? Those sort of things will help you tune your message a little bit more to be personalized so you then get a response. So that hyper-personalization is going to be really important coming into the next year. So, so, so Jen, let's let's talk about it a second, you know, without naming names yet, of, <laughs> of a recent company that we worked with that just failed miserably in that in that effort. I, I, I've become a proponent that nothing kills relationships faster than careless automation. Yes. And one of my fears is a repeat of the spray and pray that these guys have done in the last couple of months with literally not just no results, zero results. But now it's almost backfired. It, it's almost like, you know, the, my last, last note to them was, please just stop because you're, you're now creating a reputation risk. Now you're creating, you know, financial exposure and risk. Now you're, you're doing, you're not only not adding value, you're, you're damaging, you're creating harm. So, so how do you, how do you do that? How do you personalize at scale and not repeat the blunders of, of this team that they're, they're a really small startup and, and I know they're learning and they're trying, but it, it miserable is is the only way I can describe the experience so far. So how do you how do you do that? How do you personalize at scale and not repeat the disaster of this outfit over the last two months? That is a great question. And I think that's a question that a lot of people will continue to struggle with. And at its core is good data hygiene. Because if you have a bad database or it's not up to date or you haven't done any sort of enrichment based on the person's title, job, are they even still at that role? And then matching that and doing segmentation to who you're wanting to actually talk to. And to your point, creating that target logo and really tiering your segmentation. So you have your tier ones. These are the people that absolutely we want to talk to. And JB talked about this when we were, uh, when he was a guest on our show as well, but these are the ones that we absolutely want to talk to. They align with our products and services, their company values mirror ours. Those ones get the white glove service. And so you absolutely have to segment your database. The next ones, those get a little less white glove, but still it's that personalization. And then there's the third tier that you may or may not be quite as confident with that data that, there is no personalization until you know who they are. And so what I'd say in response to your question is one, segment your data. And two, unless you're fully confident on who it is you're sending your information to, don't over-personalize it. Make it personalized, but generic. And I know that's sort of a, a conundrum, but if you're not confident that you have their name right, maybe don't address it to their name, have some other very clever, catchy opening greeting. If uh, you're not sure what their role or realm of responsibility is within their organization, but you kind of have a gist, maybe they're in the finance department, a talk to that generality. So it's personalized to them, but not actually to them. Like I wouldn't necessarily, if somebody sent me an email and actually this just happened today, somebody sent me an email and they referenced University of Georgia as being a dogs fan. I am a dogs fan, but not a University of Georgia dogs fan, uh, but they referenced that because I lived in Georgia. But had they looked at my LinkedIn with any depth, they would have realized my, my dogs are on the other side of the country. And so they were trying to be personalized, but they didn't actually hit that mark. So that that's how I would address your question. And, and, and I and I and I and I'm I guess I'm imploring with every CMO uh, and every CRO uh, those that reach out on behalf of your company are ambassadors of your brand. So when I get an email from one of your people, right? that says, we've done extensive research on your background, and and have you ever thought about writing a book? 
I think that, that was is one of my favorite ones that you brought up in a previous conversation. That that is uh, for, for our audience. I've, I've published twelve books, right? And and this is in a flex, but it's it just highlights you've done zero due diligence or research or an ounce of, and and it's embarrassing. It's embarrassing to your brand. And the reason I bring it up and the reason I maybe I keep bringing it up, this is a very recognizable brand. This is a company that we're customers of today. And, and you know, beyond the merry-go-round of BDRs and SDRs that have reached out as I'm your new customer and do you want to renew? And the consistent answer has been no. It's, it's, it's you're, you're embarrassing your brand and your leadership. And... You're giving me a really good fodder for my next, you know, SKO keynote. Because well, on that I'm note, gonna, I mean, I'm, I'm going to put you front and center on what not to do. <laughs> on that note, I would also go back and say by one segmenting your data and making sure that it's clean, when you choose to do hyper personalization at scale, you also need to ensure that you don't have multiple people reaching out with the same message or conflicting messages or just coming at them in two different directions because that's also going to turn somebody off. To your point, this company that we're referencing, we have gotten multiple different emails within the same week from different individuals saying, I'm your new rep. That creates a level of confusion for your customer of, well, who really is my rep? Do they even know what they're doing? And it, it and when the reps reach out, but then we have somebody else from maybe customer success reach out asking us to be doing an enablement seminar or something like that. That is, again, is like, do you know even who we are and what we do with your product? It, it just creates that disconnect and that reason more or less to then disengage. Like we are number to this company. They don't really care about their impact on our business and how we're leveraging this tool to help us be most successful with your solution. So making sure that you have your segmentation, but then also have all departments that are touching the customer in any regard, know what each other are doing. So you don't create that overlap and that disconnect. And that goes back to my earlier point about that customer lifecycle journey you need to know what's happening along each point and have those feedback loops to the various departments. So sales needs to understand what marketing's doing and vice versa, customer success and sales, marketing, product, all of them need to come together and create that unified go-to-market motion across the entire business. For our audience, if you just joined us, we're live on Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, X, and we're talking about 2024 uh, intelligent growth predictions. We talked about a defensible mode. We talked about the pervasiveness of AI. We talked about doubling down on existing relationships. And, uh, you know, Jen shared some great insights on, you know, the fading SDR, BDR kind of role and, and streamlining that customer journey. These are all critical. Uh, and, and we promised at the beginning that of, the, of this episode that we wouldn't do any future gazing. These are just conversations we're having with senior executives and uh, clients and prospects about their challenges, their opportunities this next year. And, and they are critical in you right-sizing, you really tightening the aperture in how you show up, how you go to market, how you engage. Um, Jen, the other thing that, that you and I've talked about is I'm, I'm over the moon excited to see several clients, and I believe this will continue, uh, certainly with the student ones, uh, double down or really prioritize. I, I, I've used double down a lot, and people are going to think I'm doubling down on every every asset. That's not true. It really prioritize intelligent, probably uh, highly relevant in-person interactions. And let me just set the stage. Uh, again, old school this new school again. And and there's only so much we can all do with these Hollywood squares, right? So I, I was on a, you know, I've had several conversations just in the last week or so with clients on planning a series of intimate. This is not a 500 anything. And by the way, we do this ourselves, right? And, and we have an annual relationship economic summit, 25, 30 leaders show up. But you know what? Very diverse audience, 
as interested in contributing to the conversation as they are learning from it, very open, non-competitive, in a, in a fabulous location, and it becomes a fantastic opportunity to really create great dialogue. And, and I'm going to reiterate that people fundamentally gather for two reasons, content and community. What can I learn that I wouldn't otherwise? And who else will be there? Who else can I learn from? Who else can I grow through? And it's great to hear several clients, and, and we're in discussions about me helping them moderate these things. But imagine an intimate dinner. People you, you would invite to your home. And, and don't pitch, right? Unless you're a professional baseball player, stop pitching. Convey your credibility to the questions you ask. Convey your credibility through those incredible customers that show up and you sit them next to a prospective customer. Bring a channel partner. But we got to get away from this overt selling and really create market gravity or market pull. So these micro events, I'm really excited about. And there, there are, they're intimate. I, you know, talk, just talking to an executive about a 10 person dinner. Uh, Jen, some of you may know, I'm gonna flex on my partner for a second, captain of the US women's fly fishing team. And we're talking to a client about taking 10 of their executives on one of our learning expeditions where Jen puts them on a river 8 a.m. till about 2, and she teaches them world-class fly fishing. I take them off the river, and, we, and I ask about their strategy and their talent agenda and where and how they're investing in their growth and enabling their growth. And all of these things are correlated to their struggles on the water. And they walk away with, away from all their obligations to really focus on their aspirations, and, and it really, they walk away from that experience feeling energized to go tackle the next set of challenges in the organization. So, Jen, the idea of intimate gatherings. I think it is going to be both a strategic differentiation for companies to leverage with their customers, uh, but it's also going to be something really important for organizations with their team members to make sure that their team members are uh, attuned to the company culture and the values and really just creating that connection with their with their colleagues because many organizations have shifted to a more hybrid or a remote type environment and to your point they do a lot of their work asynchronously or in the Hollywood squares and you can only get to know someone so much and at a previous organization that I was at we implemented something called coffee chats. And it was just a 15 to 25 minute call with anyone in the organization. And you talked about everything but work. Uh, and so it was a way that you got to know your, your colleagues and your team members when you couldn't be with them face to face because that organization had no headquarters. We had no home office. The only time you actually met anyone was you go travel and you just visit and say, hey, I'm in this area or the annual retreat that that, or that company had. And so they put it as part of their core culture to have these coffee chats. And so it's just really important to focus on the people, not just the business. And so these intimate events, take your team out for a team building thing. And I'm not talking trust falls and rah, rah, any of that stuff. I actually mean just connecting on an actual human level of who you work with. And then with customers, it works fantastic. We've talked about it with several clients. We have seen several clients go do it. They actually take some of their top prospects that they've been wanting to do business with and they bring out current customers. And then those, those current customers and those prospects can then engage and interact and have really candid conversations and come away with uh, a really cool experience, a really nice connection with somebody else maybe in their space or in their industry that then is another resource for them as they're solving their business challenges. Um, but then it also then presents you as the connector. You're the thought leader. You're the glue that put those two relationships together. And so that influence is also very important as we come into 24. Uh, so again, these are these are uh, um, you know hopefully useful to you, hopefully of interest and value to you. 
Uh, we are passionate about growth. We, we, we're going to continue to write about and, and speak about and share ideas around this idea of intelligent growth. Um, I would remiss if, and our newsletter went out today as well. So if you don't subscribe, norgroup.com is a good place to subscribe or avnir.com is another good place to subscribe to our newsletter. It went out today with a just a, a heartfelt thanks to, to all of our clients, to our partners, to our, our friends and colleagues and supporters of our ideas. Uh, we've got some really, really interesting uh, aspirations for this next year between the launch of the Avnir platform to uh, probably at least one or two additional books with others uh, and, and our continued kind of expansion of our services and, and really dialing in uh, our capabilities. So, uh, Jen, I'm going to give it to you to, to close us off, but I just want to thank everybody who listened to our episodes or were able to watch uh, you know, any of these episodes throughout the year. We're really excited. Again, we're going to take a couple weeks off to spend some time with our loved ones, but we'll be back. Uh, early in January, I think uh, January 9th is our is our first episode next year, and we'll come back in January uh, really focused on continuing to drive a lot of guests uh, lining up some thinkers, 50 friends lining up a lot of CROs and CEOs uh, to really share their perspectives on intelligent growth throughout next year. So I just want to say thanks to everybody who uh, supported us this past year and continues to watch or listen to our ideas and our perspectives. Jen, you want to wrap us up? Sure. So I'd like to echo uh, David's thanks to everyone for listening and supporting the, the podcast and the live streams and everyone who jumped in with questions or comments uh, in the various episodes, and as well as all of our guests who came on this past year. And so this episode will be uh, repurposed as a podcast as soon as we're done. And so if you weren't able to join us live, please uh, search for wherever you consume podcasts for just intelligent growth. Um, as David said, coming back in 24 with some, a really great guest lineup and then just following the trends and the conversations. And we hope to bring value to you in the, the journey into 24. So thank you all for joining us. Uh, if you haven't already joined us, another way to continue this conversation is to join us in the forum. It's forum.avnir.com. It's a, our private online community where thought leaders come. David and I share insights, interesting articles just things that we're seeing and thinking about with our clients. So if you haven't joined us there, I definitely recommend that. But thanks for joining us. And we hope you have a great holiday and happy new year. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Bye-bye.